Nathan with Milestone Scholars here today, and today we're going to be talking about definitions, postulates, and theorems. So before we get into the actual video or the content, I'd like to address that I did not tell you guys last time that I switched from a computer to a tablet, so now writing is much easier, um, and we're on a different platform now. So I'm sorry I didn't make everyone aware of this last time, but here we are today. So before um, we get into the content, I also want to point out three basic rules of, well, foundational rules of the content that we're going to be covering today. And number one is that we never prove definitions. So definitions are accepted as true of things. For example, if I say a definition of an isosceles triangle, and the definition of that is that a triangle that has two equal sides. So we never prove definitions. They're accepted as true. And we use definitions to prove other things such as theorems. And number two is that we sometimes prove postulates. So if you guess that right, good job. Um, so most times postulates are accepted as true and we use them to prove theorems, but sometimes they do need proving. So it's just keep, good to keep in mind. Number three, if you guessed this already, good job, but we always prove theorems. Now that is because theorems are just established theories, but most are, well, not most, but every theorem that we're going to be covering in this video is already established as true, but for every theorem, you have to prove it in order, in order to, I guess, prove it that it's actually correct. So that's just three rules to keep, to keep in mind as we go along in this video and as you learn geometry. So the first rule that we're going to be talking about is the segment addition postulate. And just keep in mind that I will not be going in order or list or going, for example, we're not going to be just doing theorems first and the definitions after or theorems third. Uh, it's going to be random. If you want to create your own classifications, you could do so after the video. And I apologize for this, but yeah. Um, so the segment addition postulate is really simple fundamentally. So for example, if, sorry, if I have, for example, let me get this right, um, A, B, and C, points A, points B, and point C. Um, so the segment addition postulate basically is that segment AB plus segment AC, sorry, I should say segment, segment BC is congruent to segment AC. That's the idea of the segment addition postulate is that if I add one segment and another segment, they're going to equal to a third larger segment. So in this case, it's segment AB plus segment BC is congruent to seg segment AC. Next, we're going to be talking about the midpoint theorem. Um, so the midpoint theorem is also a really simple an idea. So for example, if I draw B and I draw C, draw D. So let's just say that it is given that C is a midpoint. So I'm not going to write the full thing out, but we're going to, it's given that C is the midpoint of segment BD. So basically, uh, whereas segment addition postulate involves congruence, midpoint theorem would involve equality. So basically, if the idea is that if point C is the midpoint of segment BD, it basically means that half of BC is equal to BD. And same goes for CD, basically. So half, 
sorry, um, that is the wrong way around, I apologize, half of BD is BC, and half of BD is CD, so that's really a simple, just a simple idea of the midpoint theorem, um, so it's really subjective about whether you want to do congruence or equality, um, but I personally prefer these met uh, this way because it just keeps everything in order. But it depends on what it depends on what your teacher thinks. So, the third um, proof that we're going to be talking about is the definition of midpoint. The definition of midpoint. So basically, um, it's. All, it's basically similar to the midpoint theorem, uh, but we're going to have point C here, point D here, and point E here. So let's just say that it is again given that, that D is a midpoint. midpoint. Okay, so if D is a midpoint, then that just means um, CD and D um, are basically congruent, and C, D, and D add up to uh, add up to C, E. So basically, where the midpoint theorem is half of the total length is equal to a part of um, the whole segment. For example, in this situation, it would be C, D, or D, E. But the definition of midpoint is actually C, D is congruent D, E. That's the simple idea of a definition of midpoint. Really easy. Here you have it. And number four is the angle addition postulate. So this is also really easy. So for example, if we have an angle right here, um, let's say another one here, we just have A, B, C, C, and D. So, in the, it's really just similar to the sense of the segment addition postulates, but with angles. So, if you've guessed how to, how to do it already, good job. If you have not, I will show you. So, basically, angle... Sorry, what is with me today? Um, so, angle... That is not what I wanted... So, angle ABC plus angle CBD, let's just say, is congruent to angle ABD. That's the simple idea, and it's what an angle addition postulate is. So, we're also, next up, we're going to be talking about definition of congruence. So this is extremely simple. It basically says that, for example, if I have segment AB here, another segment CD, so let's just say that these two segments are equal. So we'd write out that AB is equal to CD. And note that when you use equality, you do not write the segment dash on top of AB. So this is that the definition of congruence establishes that AB equals to CD, which means that segment AB is congruent to segment CD. That's literally it. Um, and we are also going to be talking about the transitive. We're just going to write prop for property of congruence. So this is also really easy. So let's just say I have, you could use this application for just about anything from angles to um, segments to lines to all that. Um, for example, if I have angle one, angle two, and angle three right here. 
So there's ju they're just numerical labelings of the angles. So let's just say that if angle 1 is congruent to angle 2, and if angle 2 is congruent to angle 3, so what can we conclude from this? Or how do we draw conclusions from this? Well, the transitive property of congruence would state that from these two statements that I'm boxing in right now, we can conclude that angle 1 is congruent to angle 3. So you can use it for anything, just as I said, you can use it for segments, you can use it for the even shapes, and yeah, that's the idea of the transitive property of congruence. And next up, we're going to talk about the definition of definition of perpendicular lines. So this is also a really simple idea. So for example, if I have say x point x point y point z and I have an intersection point of O right here and let's just say that x um, OX is perpendicular to YZ so the conclusion that we can draw is that angle XOZ and angle XOY they are both equal Sorry, um, they are both, it's important actually to remember that they are both right. So basically we've established that XOZ is right and XOY is right. And that's it. Um, we're also adding on to the definition of perpendicular lines. So we're going to talk about the definition of right angles. So basically, if, for example, I take our previous example, and I have x here, y here, z here, and intersection point of O here, since we've already established that x, o, z is right, and x, o, y is right, then the definition of right angles is that angle XOZ is equal to 90 degrees. Angle XOY is equal to 90 degrees as well. That's it to that. And next up, we're going to be talking about the right angle congruence. Theorem. So this is also, I guess, if you want to view it as one of, you could also see it as an addition to the previous two um, definitions. This theorem basically states that all right angles are congruent. That is the idea of this. So for example, um, if I take the definition of right angles, for example, I have one right angle here, I have one right angle here, I have another right here, I have another right here, I have another right here. For example, if I know that all, for example, all of these are right, I can basically establish that all of these are congruent. All of these angles are congruent. So really simple, all right angles are congruent. Um, and then we're going to talk about two properties. Again, one, I'm just gonna write both out, although they're separate, is the substitution property. One, another is the reflexive. And it's important to write reflexive instead of reflective, which is a common mistake. So substitution property is basically, for example, it's really similar to the transitive property, but it's just that little bit different, you know? So the trans substitution property basically is that if I have an angle, angle one here, angle two here, 
and angle 3 here. This just basically means that if angle 1 is congruent to angle 2, then angle 1 is also congruent to angle 3. That just basically means that since angle 1 is congruent to angle 2, I can replace angle 1 with angle 2, drawing the conclusion that angle 2 is congruent to angle 3. Now we're going to be talking about the reflexive property. For example, if I draw a segment here, segment EF. So what can be, what can be concluded about this simple segment? Well, the reflexive property emphasizes on this point in the sense that it's very obvious, yet people wouldn't think about it. So basically, the reflexive property states that EF is congruent to FE, which is amazing because it's true yet so obvious. Um, so next, we're just going to be talking about um, some postulates that are just going to be used. So basically, the first one, or should I say the 11th one, I guess, through any two points, there is exactly one line. Now what this means is that if I have two random points, let's just say I have point A here, and I have point B here, there is, an, there is a line that exists be, um, between them, and that is true because there is a line that's not very well drawn, but there is a line. So basically, through any two points, there will be a line, and if I have point C here and I have point D here, there would also be a line that exists in between them, and I completely missed point D right there, so really sorry about that. That's the idea of it. And for the 12th postulate that we're going to be talking about. Um, so basically, there must be, sorry, must be um, three points in order to define a plane. Now this basically means that there must be three points not on a line I just want to point that out. Not all in a not all in a line in order to define a plane. So basically a line let's just say I have line C D here. A line is linear. But if you stack up lines, you will be able to get a plane. So for example, I if for example I have let's just say twenty million CDs and I stack all of these lines up, stack all of these lines, I would be able to eventually get a plane. So basically, if I have one line, AB, right here, and I have an external point, Z, and these are in the same plane, let's just assume that, so that just means that a plane can be defined I just drew it right through Z, whoops. A plane can be defined with these three points. And note that the point must be not on the line because if it is on the line, we would just end up with something linear like CD right here. Um, so the 13th one that we are going to be talking about is that space needs four points to define um, not all in one plane. That's really, so this is really similar to the plane idea, whereas an infinite amount of lines stacked up would get you a plane. An infinite, and for example, an infinite amount of planes, for example, stacked up would get you space. Um, so that's the basic idea, and space needs four points to define, and not all in one plane, because if all four points was in one plane, 
then we'd end up with one plane and not space. So for example, if I have A and if I have B, I have C and I have D here. Well, let's say for example, A, B, C, all three of these points are in a plane. Now let's just say D is in this plane, in this plane right here. So basically that defines space because really we could almost see like a three dimensional figure. For example, this cube right here that can be drawn to envelop all three of these points inside. And that is the idea of why space needs four points to define. And the last postulate that we're going to be talking about today is number 14, if two planes intersect, get out of here, okay, um, then they, then sorry, then the intersection is a line. Or should I say their intersection? Um, so basically, this is also a really simple idea. For example, if I have plane E right here, and if I also, let's just say, grab a, um, a point. That is absolutely horrible. Let's say I also have I also have let's just say I would also have a plane F here. So as you can see these two planes intersect at this line right here. We're just call this line L. So basically every plane intersects at one line. If I if I was to draw like plane A right here and a plane B right here, and if even if I would have like for example a plane F right here, and for example I could even draw more planes, which I I could do for you guys because you are my special ones. Um, let's just see. I have another point C here. Or oh, plane C here, sorry. And as you can see, all four of these planes intersect at this one line right here. So basically, if two planes intersect, then their intersection is a line. Thank you for listening to this very, very long video of Milestone Scholars.